Hello, I'm Pastor Chuck Phelps, the senior pastor of Colonial Hills Baptist Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. This morning, I would like to begin a series of messages that I've entitled Survivor Stories, Learning to Live Once the Storm is Passed. Over the next several weeks, we will learn some valuable lessons from some of the Bible's great storm survivors. Now, should the Lord tarry his coming, I believe that people will look back on the pandemic of 2020 and say, Oh, you should have seen it, Sonny. <laughs> Everything shut down. No one went to school. No one went out to eat. The stock market tanked. The churches all shut down. There was a strange mist in the air. I can't even describe the devastation. Now, you may think that you'll never embellish the reality of the COVID crisis. But if we're anything like the generations that have preceded us, we will. So, before we're tempted to tell our tall tales... I think it's well for us to open our Bibles and discover how the saints of old survived their storms. We'll need to live once the storm is past. I want to invite you to take your Bible and turn with me today to the Gospel of Mark, the fourth chapter, Mark chapter 4. We'll begin our reading in verse 35 as Mark describes the day the disciples almost bought the farm. Let's see what we can learn as we listen to our Lord, as he says, peace be still. In Mark 4, verses 35 to 41, we read, And the same day, when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him, even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships, and there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is one of the Bible's most famous storm stories. Today, we learn how to have peace when the storm is past. Let's ask God to bless as we look into his word. Father, I pray that you'd use your word today to minister to some heart that the message would give hope in the storm and help to those who need to come to Christ as Savior. For it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. Well, it was a beautiful sunny day as our family traveled across the wide open plains of South Dakota. We were on our way to our new home in Colorado. That's when it happened. There was a cloud of smoke barreling in our direction from the opposite lane of the highway. An eastbound car was off the highway racing through the median and headed right in our direction. Our peaceful journey became a forgotten memory as we dealt with the panic of our predicament. Every one of us knows what it means to go from tranquility to terror, from peace to panic. David, the shepherd king, acknowledged the unpredictable nature of our lives when he said to his friend Jonathan, there is but a step between me and death. What David said to Jonathan 3,000 years ago remains true for us today. 2 Samuel 20 and verse 3 says, There is but a step between me and death. On the last day of 2019, Chinese officials informed the World Health Organization that they were treating dozens of people for a new virus. At that time, there was little evidence that the virus could spread through human-to-human -human contact. On the 11th of January, China reported its first coronavirus death. Less than two months later, on the 29th of February, an American died of coronavirus. Coronavirus has now spread to 177 countries. Over 280,000 people have died. In less than three months, the world has been turned upside down. People are facing a monumental storm of global proportions. The truth is, we simply do not know when or how the next storm will come into our lives. We only know that they will certainly come. So let me ask you something today. 
Are you equipped to be a storm survivor? We're opening our Bibles this morning to Mark chapter 4. There's a storm story in Mark 4 that demands our attention. Almost 2,000 years ago, our Lord's disciples were in a storm-induced panic on the Sea of Galilee when they cried out to the Savior and he gave them peace. There are some great lessons for us to learn as we discover how to find peace when the storm has passed. Let's begin by learning about the timing of our storms. The timing of our storms. Last Sunday afternoon, a 50-year-old friend of mine went for a walk with his college-age daughter. Just a few steps from returning home, my friend collapsed. Within moments, his wife was administering CPR. An ambulance arrived on the scene very quickly and transported him to the hospital, but he'd already entered into heaven. Just seven months earlier, his brother ended a long battle with cancer and slipped out into eternity. Tim and Steve leave behind wives, children, parents, an entire community of friends. All these are today facing a storm. You see, no one knows when a storm will strike, but there are a few things that we do know about the timing of a storm. Notice with me in Mark 4, verse 35, we read, And the same day when the even was come. Oh, what a day it had been. In chapter 4 and verse 1, we find the Savior surrounded by such a multitude of people that he entered into a ship, he sat down, and he taught the vast assembly as they gathered on the shore. Mark 4, verse 33, points out that the Lord shared many parables with the crowd. Now, according to verse 35, the exhausted instructor asks his disciples to sail with him to the other side of the sea. According to verse 36, they sent the multitude away, and they set sail right into a great storm. The details of this passage are very important. You see, often when we encounter a storm, Satan comes to tell us that it's a storm of God's judgment. The old accuser takes advantage of our storms. Satan loves to see us accuse God of being malevolent. Satan wants us to shake our faith when storms strike our souls. But look carefully at the timing of the storm spoken of in Mark 4 and discover with me that storms can come during times of obedience. The disciples who faced the storm were the same disciples who obeyed the Savior when he said, let us pass over unto the other side. These were not disobedient disciples experiencing the chastening of an angry God. These were obedient disciples facing a disastrous storm. Often when we find ourselves in a storm, we take over the work of Diabolos. After all, Revelation 12.10 says that Satan is an accuser of the brethren. Storms often tempt us to take over for Satan. Give him a holiday. Our troubled mind says, surely this is God's judgment for my wrongdoing or for my failures. Listen, while I would not discount the need to confess your wrongdoing or your failure to God and find his forgiveness, I want to caution you in order to keep you from illegitimate self-blame. Remember, Job chapter 1 tells us that Job was praying when his ten children died. Storms can come during times of obedience. Note with me also that storms can come during times of blessing. Mark 4 verse 1 reminds us that Jesus was teaching a great multitude on the day that the storm came. The storm that threatened the lives of the disciples actually interrupted a day filled with blessings. You should never be surprised when you quickly slip from a mountaintop into a valley. There is but a step between me and death, and there is but a step between each of us and disaster. Storms can come during times of service. Verse 36 makes this matter very clear. The disciples were serving the Lord as they set sail across the sea. The verse says, they took him even as he was in the ship. While some will face storms sent from God because they, like Jonah, are going astray, others will face storms while they're involved in faithful service. While in a ship of obedience, 
blessing, and service. The disciples faced a Category 5 crisis. The Sea of Galilee is over 650 feet below sea level. It's the lowest freshwater lake in the world. Towering above the sea is Mount Hermon. It rises 9,200 feet above sea level and surrounded by hills. The Sea of Galilee is uniquely vulnerable to storms. Storms come quickly. They come unexpectedly. They come dangerously there just as they come into our lives. I traveled with Wayne Anderson on a gospel team as a college student. Wayne was from Virginia Beach, Virginia. His father served as a faithful assistant pastor while rearing a large family. Wayne left home to serve with his wife as a missionary in central Mexico. While serving in Mexico, Wayne's mission board contacted him to let him know that if he wanted to see his father alive, he'd need to come home. His father, you see, was dying of cancer. Wayne and his family left home very early. By 11.30 in the morning, they traveled 450 miles, arriving in Monterey, Mexico. On the bypass around Monterey, a large truck ran a stop sign, crashed into the passenger side of the Anderson vehicle, and instantly killed Wayne's wife, Debbie. Wayne's daughter, Christy, died in his arms. His little boy, Justin, had a broken leg and a broken hip. Justin's cuts would require over 60 stitches to stop his bleeding. Wayne had broken ribs, a knee torn out of joint. He required over 30 stitches in his head and on his arms. When did the storm come? It came while Wayne and his family were obedient to the calling of God, serving as missionaries in Mexico. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall appear, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Messengers of misery can knock on any door at any time without any invitation. So let's learn something else. Let's learn about the trauma of our storms. The trauma of our storms. In verses 37 and 38, the Spirit of God provides us with some details about the dangerous storm that threatened the Lord and his disciples. We read, And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he, speaking of the Savior, was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. They awake him. They said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? The disciples set no example of courage as the storm set in upon them. The disciples were certainly not paragons of peace. As the Lord, the Prince of Peace, rested in the boat, the disciples scrambled for survival. They ripped down the sails. They manned the oars. They picked up the buckets to build the boat, and they hung on for life. The trauma of the storm caused the disciples to mar their testimony. There's a little phrase in Mark 4, verse 36, that I want to bring to your attention. Verse 36 says, and I quote, There were also with him other little ships. I have a book in my library by the great Baptist preacher T.T. T. Shields of Toronto. The book is entitled, Other Little Ships. The book is a collection of sermons. One of the sermons in the book inspired the publisher to give the book its title. Over 100 years ago, the little phrase, other little ships, so moved Dr. Shields that he preached an entire message about it. The great preacher's application is gripping. You see, many of us fail to consider that storms will bring out the best or the worst that is in a disciple and there are always other little ships, other little ships looking on. You never go through a storm alone. Someone else is in the storm with you. It may be your spouse, it may be your fellow employee, it may be your children, it may be a neighbor, an acquaintance, it may be a friend. In Psalm 73, Asaph opens up to God about his doubts. You see, the prosperity of the ungodly and the adversity of God's children 
was a great mystery to Asaph. As he considers his burden, Asaph wisely says, If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. Down deep in the trenches of his discouragement, Asaph was remembering the other little ships. He didn't want to offend the other children of God. Storms will either make your testimony clear or they will mar your testimony and confuse. And there are always other little ships. They too are experiencing the storm. They will need the light of the Lord to shine through you or they may be lost. In the storm, the faithless disciples marred their testimonies and they misdirected their energies. Mark has so described the plight of the disciples as to allow us to almost hear their voices. Man the oars, trim the sails, hang on. When will we ever learn? There are some predicaments and some perils which we cannot escape by our own efforts. You cannot rid yourself of your sins and earn a place in heaven by your own efforts. The Bible makes this very clear when it says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Yet there are many who are attempting to enter heaven by their good works, church attendance or baptism, or kindnesses to others, hoping that the scale will weigh on their side. But friend, you're misdirecting your efforts. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Jesus came to earth from heaven. He lived a life without sin. He spread out his arms of love on the cross of Calvary to die for your sins and for mine. Three days later, he rose from the grave so that whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Call upon him today. No doubt the disciples were blistering their hands on the oars. The disciples screamed instructions to each other, believing that their lives depended on it. They misdirected their energies, just as many Christians do, when they try to carry their burdens alone. Disciple, you have the invitation of a living God to cast your care upon him, for he careth for you. Stop misdirecting your energies and seek the Lord who says, Call upon me, and I will show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Sadly, it seems like the trauma of the storm caused the disciples to misunderstand God's motives. In despair, the disciples cry, Carest thou not that we perish? The disciples' question is a great revelation. Their cry is in the present tense. Literally, they're calling out, We're perishing! We're perishing! Don't you care that we're perishing? They saw themselves as goners. In the storm, they lost trust in the Lord's compassion. Their cry implies a resentment toward the Lord. How can he be sleeping while we are all drowning? How sad. But understand that the squeeze of the storm wrung out doubts, doubts that were deep in the hearts of the disciples. The disciples faced the storm on the Sea of Galilee even before James wrote, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. The disciples were in the waves of the sea before Paul wrote, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, which says, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. But the disciples had the promise of God a promise found in Isaiah 43 and verse 2. There the word of God says, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. In their trouble, the disciples misunderstood that God always brings storms for our good and for his glory. If you would be a storm survivor, and find peace when the storm subsides, you really need to learn about the taming of our storms. The taming of our storms. 
The sleeping Savior rouses from his slumber and he speaks to the sea, Peace be still. Verse 39 says, And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. I love how Hendrickson puts it in his commentary on this passage. He says, The wind and the waves synchronize in the sublime symphony of a solemn silence. Do you know when our storms are tamed? They are tamed when we cease from our struggles and turn to the Savior. So bring your burden to the Lord, the one who said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Psalm 107, 27 says, He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof cease. Your extremity becomes his opportunity. Do you know when our storms are tamed? Our storms are tamed when we cease from our struggles and turn to the Savior. And when the word of God is spoken, it silences the storm. When Jesus spoke, the earth appeared. Ex nihilo, out of nothing. When Jesus cried from the cross, it is finished. The penalty of our sin was marked paid in full. When Jesus called, peace be still, the waves that he created miraculously quit moving. And today, Jesus speaks through the word of God. This book can silence any storm. Psalm 119, 165 says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. The Bible is the life raft of the soul. Open it and find peace. Open it, trust God's promises. Open it and let it settle your storm. In Mark 4, we learn a great deal about storms. We learn about the timing of our storms, the trauma of our storms, the taming of our storms, and the testimony of our storms. The storm was the vehicle to teach the disciples lessons that were essential to their spiritual development. You see, there is theoretical theology and there is also experiential theology. Both are important. We must know God with our whole mind and love him with our whole heart. We learn to love God experientially when we survive a storm. Do you know why? Because in the storm, we discover his presence. I love the promise of Hebrews 13.5. Hebrews 13.5 says, For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now can I ask you to write down four references, four verses that you ought to review regularly, that you ought to know well. There are verses that will be of help to you when you're seeking peace in the midst of your storm. There are verses that will sustain you even when the storm is past. Are you ready? First, write down Hebrews 13.5. Memorize it. Meditate on it. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Saints who preceded us through the storms often sang, No, never alone. No, never alone. He promised never to leave me. He claims me as his own. What a wonderful, comforting truth. He has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Hebrews 13, verse 5. You see, in the storm, we see his power. Now, the second reference I want you to write down is Mark 10, verse 27. Mark 10, verse 27. And this is what it says. With God, all things are possible. Yes, we read in the Bible the promise of God that nothing for him is too hard. Impossible things he has promised to do. If we faithfully trust in his word, nothing is impossible. If you put your trust in God, nothing is impossible if you're trusting in his word. In our storms, we witness God's ability to do the impossible. All right, now there's a third reference I want you to write down. It's Hebrews 4, verse 15. This is a verse that reminds us that in the storm, we feel his pity. In the storm, we feel his pity. 
Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Jesus is a compassionate Savior and a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Our cries move him with compassion. Oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. There's one last verse to write down. Write down John 14, 27. You see, in the storm, we find his peace. It's in the storm that we find his peace. In John 14, 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now, we don't know if Peter lived long enough to have grandchildren. Can you imagine if he did? As he sat in his home, one of them may have crawled up on his knee and said, Grandpa, Grandpa, can you tell us again about when Jesus silenced the storm? With a smile, Peter would have recalled how the storm came unexpectedly that day. He would have confessed that he didn't exactly respond the right way. Then, with eyes focused on his friend, the one that sticks closer than a brother, he would begin to speak knowing that he'd see Jesus again soon. And he would have remembered that Jesus just said, peace be still. And children, Peter would have said, the sea became like glass. Now, while we don't know if Peter ever shared this story with his grandchildren, we do know that he shared the story with a young man named Mark his traveling companion. And almost 2,000 years ago, Mark, Peter's traveling companion, was moved by the Spirit of God to write the story in the book that now bears his name. Now, someday your children and grandchildren will ask you how you survived your storm. Will you be able to tell them that Jesus silenced your storm and gave you peace? It might be a financial storm. It might be the COVID virus. It might be a storm of a relationship or an employment situation. Will you be able to tell them Jesus gave you peace? My friend, Wayne Anderson, lost his wife and little girl on a highway in Monterey, Mexico. After the immediate impact of the storm was passed, he wrote these words, quote, even though the loss was extremely difficult for me to accept emotionally, I knew that God had purposed and planned the deaths of my wife and five-year-old daughter. He went on, and although it's often difficult for us in this life to understand the whys of God's plans, of one thing I am confident, said Wayne, God does all things well, and he loves and cares for his children. He went on, Today, my mother and my son are serving with me in Mexico. Jesus spoke to Wayne's heart and said, Peace be still. And today, he can give you peace as well. The Bible makes the message clear. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So, will you call on Jesus today and accept the gift of salvation that he died upon the cross to purchase for you? and know a peace that passes understanding. And believer, you can cast your care on him today. He does care for you. In a moment, Pastor Greg is going to share an invitation for you to take your next spiritual step. So listen carefully. We'd love to help you come to Christ or help you carry your burden. May God bless you.